Lord, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. You restore my soul. You lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to take some time now to go to God in prayer, and I know that there are some prayer um, concerns that you may have, um, but before I, I do that, I wanted to spend a couple minutes, um, I've gotten a lot of questions this week. Um, people learned this week uh, that the Attorney General is a United Methodist, and um, 
And so as a result, I've gotten a number of questions about a particular policy that's been implemented at the border of separating uh, families. And um, so one of the things that, uh, that the Attorney General spoke about was Romans 13 and how it applies in his, in his work. And so if you've not looked at Romans 13, I, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Um, you can open up to it now if you'd like. Um, so the first four verses in particular, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. So <clears throat> I'm not an expert in the law, I'm not an expert in immigration policy, but biblical interpretation is definitely in my, in my wheelhouse. And I definitely also understand um, the appeal of this passage when it's your job to enforce the law. But it's also a very tricky passage to interpret in a country that had its genesis in a revolution. Because in 1775, loyalists to the crown also invoked this passage and said, colonists, don't do this thing. So biblical interpretation is never as simple and as straightforward as we want it to be. And as Christians, it's important that our approach to the law is also informed by compassion. And so if we keep reading even just a little bit beyond those verses in that same chapter in, in Romans 13, owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So we also, on top of that, have kind of a, just this multiplicity of passages, both in the Old and the New Testaments, that urge God's people to practice hospitality toward all people, but then especially toward immigrants. In fact, um, the word that in Greek is hospitality that we find in the New Testament is um, precisely the opposite of xenophobia. It's the same root, xeno, but then instead of phobia, it's phileia, which is love of the stranger. So whenever we find these passages in the Old Testament, we find um, typically the argument for why we need to take care of those who are among us as immigrants is because remember, people of Israel, you were once aliens in Egypt. I think another piece that's important for us to remember is that Jesus himself and his family, they were refugees. So they fled the regime of King Herod, they went to Egypt, they were forced into it because they were afraid for their lives. And so when it comes to this particular situation at the border, the United Methodist Church stands with many, many other churches. And you know, because I'm friends with a lot of pastors, a lot of, a lot of uh, people of different denominations, you know, every few minutes I see you know, a different denomination making a statement about this policy. So it's very rare when you find the Roman Catholics, the United Methodists, um, AMEs, AMEZs, um, even Franklin Graham. I mean, you can, the whole gamut of people um, in condemning this policy. And in fact, our show, social principles, which were last reviewed in 2016, long before this policy was implemented, long before this administration came into, came into being. So it's not as though we're responding you know, to this particular thing, but we made this statement well in advance of that. We have a, a section of our social principles that deals with uh, the treatment of immigrants. And in part, this is what it says. It says, we oppose immigration policies that separate family members from each other or that include detention of families with children. And we call on local churches to be in ministry with immigrant families. So again, I wanted to talk with this, with 
you all today because uh, even today as I walked in, there was another message on the, <laughs> on the phone. You know, what, you know, what's going on here? And so I thought it might be helpful uh, to take a couple minutes just to clarify, you know, the church's position on this matter and encourage you to be in prayer. So I thank you to, uh, for hearing me out this morning on this. I also uh, became aware overnight of a, a shooting that happened in Trenton. Um, and so we want to uh, be in prayer for those who are affected by uh, this violence uh, that happened just kind of in our backyard at an arts festival. So we want to pray uh, for those who are affected by that. And uh, as we go uh, through our time of prayer, I'll invite you to lift up uh, your own concerns and your own prayers. So let's take just a couple minutes and uh, settle ourselves in silence and then let's pray together. Gracious God, you are the Lord of both heaven and earth. And as we celebrate the gift of music today, we give you thanks for all things that are beautiful in the world. We give you thanks for those who bring beauty into our lives. Today we give you thanks for fathers and those who have been like fathers to us. We pray for fathers and grandfathers and brothers and sons everywhere. And pray that you might Help each one of us to understand what it means um, to fulfill these roles well. We are grateful for the love of fathers in our lives. Lord, we do pray for the nation today. We pray for all those who um, have come seeking refuge. And we ask that you might be with us you give us wisdom to know how to react. Lord, we're grateful for your work in us. We're grateful for your work in the world. We're grateful for your word that challenges us to think more deeply. Lord, we know that there are situations in our personal lives, situations in our families, things that are struggles that we have, that we want to lift before you now. So I invite you, just wherever you are, to lift up names and situations that you'd like to be in prayer for this morning. God, we thank you that in each one of these situations, you hear us, you know us. We give you thanks that you love us. And we just pray that as we are uh, gathered together here this morning, you might be at work among us. We pray for those who are affected by this uh, violence overnight in Trenton. We just ask that you would uh, heal those who are hurt, that you would watch over this family that lost someone that they love. Lord, we pray for an end to violence. We pray for peace in your world. And we pray that you might move our hearts to be willing to take action. But we're grateful for your power in us. We're grateful for your strength, which encourages us. And we're grateful for your guidance that leads us. We give you thanks in all things through your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.